Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our own image, in our own likeness. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, then one of the seraphim flew to him with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, as to his human nature, was a descendant of David, and who, through the spirit of holiness, was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. I, John, your brother and companion in suffering and kingdom, and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. In York, there's a large maze made of corn. They estimate when we were there, it would take 90 minutes to get into the center of it, ring the bell, and then you can come back out. After around 45 minutes of the 90 minutes, we were starting to get slightly anxious. Will we find the middle? I don't know how big 17 and a half hectares is. So Isabel, is that big? There is a maze, which is just outside of Milan. It's made of bamboo, designed by, I think, somebody called Federico Ricci. It's 17 and a half hectares in size. So if a farmer tells us it's big, it's big. It's the largest one in the world. Who would enter that maze? How long would it take you to traverse that maze into the center and then back out again? I begin with that concept of the maze, which you get in big stately homes or outside of major cities, because for some people, that's what it's like when you get talking about things like the Trinity. They say, well, that, look, 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 keep it simple. That was a phrase they were using at the assembly. Kiss, keep it simple. And then, normally the people's names actually started with an S. Keep it simple. But God reveals himself as Trinity. And so it's surely an act of disobedience to stand at the outside of the maze and say, I'm not going in. I don't think we can know anything about it. It's just too mysterious. People spill ink and spill blood over this stuff. I refuse to go in. Could you not hear in every single reading the Trinity, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Isaiah, Matthew, Romans, it's all the way through. So this morning, let's just do an exercise in two halves. Let's say three things that the Trinity is not, and we'll just clear that straight up. Three things the Trinity isn't. And that's pretty good if you're able to say what something isn't, but I often feel that's only half the work. You know, when someone comes to the door and says to me, I didn't like that. Good, that's half the work. What did you like? But I often don't get the second half. So we excel in the negative often. And I don't mind that, but at least try and work the positive as well. I didn't like that, but I did like this. And I did like that. And I did value this. So we don't want to do that with the Trinity. The Trinity isn't. 
without going in to say what the Trinity actually is. So here's the first thing, the Trinity most certainly isn't. When the Jehovah Witnesses come knocking on the door and they say the following, you all made that up, they say. In the whole of the Middle East, you all made that up. And they make out, I suppose, that actually this notion of the Trinity is something that the church invented. It's just an idea that we concocted. But is it? Think of those readings. Isaiah, who will go for us? Is God talking about himself and the angels? Or is he talking about himself in a more complex form than simply one? What about when we hear, and Rod read it, God made us in his image? Our image, he said. Well, we're not made in the image of angels. And yet he referred to himself in the plural. Let's make man in our image, in the image of male and female. So the first thing I would say is, no, the church did not make up the Trinity. The English Puritan John Owen once said, and it's very true, the Scripture reveals the Trinity. The Scripture does not fully explain the Trinity. The arrogance is, by not fully understanding something, you then dismiss it. It's not given to us to fully understand, but it is given to us to fully accept. I hope we can be humble enough to accept what we don't fully understand. I don't understand how my car works, but I accept I can use it and benefit from it. I accept you can benefit from it. I don't feel I need to stand here and explain away all the deeper truths of the Trinity, but I do believe that by accepting God is Trinity, I can be blessed by that. And I know you can as well. So let's just hit that first nail on the head. No, it is not something made up by the church. Here's the second thing. Often this is annexed to music, and maybe the third one, a nice a liturgical rhyme. It's not a pecking order in God. You sang this morning, and you'll sing again, one of the very few items of praise that has interchange in the Trinity. Because in the old Red Book, those of you who can remember the Red Book, which was the hymn book of the Church of Scotland, it was called CH3. It always had the doxology on the end of Psalms and on many of the hymns. To Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the God whom heaven and earth adore. Always Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Always Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. As though it were only Matthew 28, one of the readings we had this morning, that speaks of the Trinity. And what happens when you have the prayers that always end in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, or the Latin Mass in nomine Patri et Filii Spiritus Sancti, Amen. All the people say, Amen. What happens is, it's very easy to develop a pecking order. The Father. The Father. The Son, oh, he's, he's like two I see. And the Holy Spirit, well, he's surely less than the Son and, and less than the Father. In fact, some people don't even call the Holy Spirit by person. They call the Holy Spirit it. It can do this. It, the Spirit, it can do that. The Spirit's not an it. The Holy Spirit's a he. Personhood in God. Three in one and one in three. A mystery. But not a mystery that we've invented. And certainly not a mystery that has a pecking order. So we had to work quite hard. But I thought, is, is there a praise that has the Trinity with interchange? And it does. The Getty hymn, We Believe in One True God. Father, Spirit, Son. There's no pecking order there. God is not the Father as CEO, with the Son as 2IC, and the Holy Spirit as some kind of a backup plan if the other two are absent. There is equality in the Holy Trinity. If you have the Spirit of God working in you, you have God working in you. 
all of God. So there's no pecking order. And the third one, yes, a nice liturgical or musical rhyme. It probably is quite a nice liturgical rhyme to end prayers with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, that's when you know the prayer is drawing to a close. And all these things we ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it has to be more than just a nice thing tagged on to maybe a long prayer. That's what it's not. I don't want to be guilty by standing here and giving you the negative and telling you, I didn't like that. I want to give you positive so you can take away things that you can learn about the Trinity that bless you. And the first thing I want to say is, when you ponder God as Father, Spirit, Son, or as Spirit, Son, Father, or as Father, Son, and Spirit, however the order you want to have it in your mind, because in the Bible, it's always presented in different orders, I want you to know, by God being Trinity, you should be assured that you're loved by God. Now, you might say, if I wanted to think about being loved by God, surely I would read about Jesus blessing someone, a poor person, or someone with an ailment, or just actually read a passage where Jesus talks about loving us. Why would I meditate on something as bizarre, a labyrinth as confusing as, as the Trinity? And I'm telling you to meditate on that because actually by understanding God as Trinity, it makes his love for you and me all the clearer. Birds make nests. They're creative, aren't they? And it's nesting season at the moment, so don't cut your hedges. But they make nests out of necessity. Even if they try and shape a nest on the ground, some uh, out in remote places near cliffs, they just literally nest on the ground. But they always make something to be able to put the egg in out of necessity to try and protect it. And foxes, they create layers for their young and to keep themselves safe. They create... But again, they create out of necessity. And then you take humans. And we create out of necessity. We build houses. It'd be difficult to survive a, a Western Europe winter without shelter. We create out of necessity. But not only out of necessity. We create out of desire, don't we? We paint sunsets. And sometimes we paint a sunset with no thought to sell the painting. So it's not even though you've created something for revenue. You say to the person, are you selling it? No. Why did you paint it? Because I want to look at it. I want to enjoy it. I want you to enjoy it. You've not created that out of necessity. You've created it out of desire. What about some fine musical pieces which are created? Out of desire. Some people write music with no intention of trying to bleed every crotchet for a pound. It's created that others would be taken up by it. And as Christians, we would use the word blessed. It's created and composed so that other human beings could be blessed with the music and moved maybe in whatever way the person is wanting to move the listener. And what did Rod's reading say? You're made in the image of God. You're made in the image of God. You create out of desire. God creates out of desire. The Trinity means that God was never alone. Before the heaven and the earth, there was God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is why Yahweh is not Allah. Allah is not one and three and three and one. Allah is one. And before Allah makes anything, Allah is on his own. Could he have been lonely? Does Allah create because he wants others? Well, I don't know. It's a possibility. If you're one single thing, is it not possible that you've created so that you're no longer one single thing? You're one thing with other things. 
Yahweh, however, the God of the Bible, so never be persuaded when those so-called educated people say, Allah and Yahweh, it's the same God. It's not the same God. It's a completely different God. Yahweh is Trinitarian, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's this three in one and one in three. Allah is quite clear. He has no son and no more diversity in him than you or me. I always find that odd. God is not more diverse than you or me. It's almost like he's kind of in our image rather than us being in his. But Yahweh is more diverse than you or me. He's three in one and one in three. And he creates not because there was a day when Yahweh was lonely. And he thought, oh, I don't like this sensation of being alone. I'll make a heaven and an earth. I'll create creatures. So if he didn't create you and me because he needed to, why did he create you and me? The same way the composer creates the orchestral score. The same way the artist puts paint on canvas. The same way the child constructs something with Lego. He created out of a desire, not out of a need, which means you didn't need to exist. But you do. The next time you're looking at yourself in the mirror, and you feel worthless, sometimes we can. And you feel, no one would miss me if I wasn't here. The one that made you would miss you. God made you. You're precious in His sight. In those moments when you feel deep isolation, people don't get me, people don't get me. Ah, oh, the one who made you gets you. He gets you fully. He's the one that created you in the first place. So you look in that mirror and you affirm, I am loved by God, whether I feel I'm loved by God or not. I am. God is Trinity, and He didn't need to make me. But for some reason, out of goodness and generosity, He's made this place out of a desire. The Trinity shows we are loved. The Trinity shows that we're saved. Now, how much of God, and there is really the Romans passage you might think about, how much of God is involved in the gospel? You know, some people think, oh, it's Jesus comes and He saves us, and yeah, that's true. But in Jenny's reading, it's the Holy Spirit that raises Him from the grave. It's the Spirit of God that raises the Son of God. And whose idea is it that the Son would come in the first place? Well, in Luke 1, you could have read that passage as well. Gabriel says to Mary, I'm sent here by God, the Father, to tell you you're going to give birth to the Son. And if you're wondering how as a virgin you'll get pregnant, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So they are the Trinity at Advent when we're thinking about the coming of the Lord Jesus in the incarnation. But the fact is, it's not 33% of God that's involved in saving us. And so Jesus comes and He bears the cross and the Father's going, well, I wouldn't have done that. And the Holy Spirit's saying, well, that's a waste of time. All of God is involved in our salvation. That's maybe why it's a problem if you only ever think of the atonement in terms of the crucifix. Now, when you look at the crucifix, you see an artist trying to depict Jesus. How do you depict the Father? And how do you depict the work of the Holy Spirit at the cross? Because all three are there. I say that to assure you, if you wonder, am I really saved? Am I really good enough? Am I really a Christian? Does God really think that of me? The Bible tells us all of God, not 33% in the form of the Son, as though you could say the Son is 33%. He's fully God. But if you just take one, the Son or the Spirit, all is involved in our redemption. And I move to the third and the final one. It shows the Trinity that we are commissioned. In the Isaiah reading, Robin had that one. God says, who will go for us? 
who will go for us? Isaiah says, here am I, send me. All of God is at work in commissioning you to live a Christian life. All of Him. Not part of Him. Every single bit of Him. So what is the Trinity? It shows that we're loved. It shows we're saved. It shows we're commissioned. What isn't the Trinity? It's not being made up by us or by generations before us. It's not a pecking order in God, and it's not a nice liturgical or musical rhyme. And it's certainly, certainly not a maze bigger than 17 and a half hectares that if you enter, you will end up more bamboozled than when you went in. I believe when we enter the mystery of God, the labyrinth of His truth, the Spirit of God will work. And the longer you spend in the maze, the bigger the blessing. You'll be blessed. And you'll be given grace to bless other people. And is that not a noble desire this morning? To come to worship and to say, Father, bless me. And help me be a blessing to whoever crosses my path. That's a noble prayer. That's a noble desire. And God can work that through the wonder of the Trinity.